Well, kia ora to everybody. Uh, Bruce Harrell is my name. I'm the director of the Goodfellow Unit. Well, tonight we're going to be talking about obstetrics and paediatrics, and we've got a great panel lined up for you. Uh, my first uh, speaker tonight is Amy Brighton. She's a maternal fetal medicine specialist at uh, Counties Manukau DHB. Over to you, Amy. Um, so I'm a pediatric gynecologist at Minamore and I'm a maternal fetal medicine fellow and I've been quite involved with um, everything to do with COVID. So I'm just going to give um, a brief run through of um, management of COVID-19 in pregnancy um, with a specific focus on uh, community care, when to refer, all those sorts of things um, that will hopefully be useful for GPs. So as you know from your previous um, webinars and from our colleagues in Australia, um, most women with Omicron um, are actually pretty well. Um, they sort of get flu-like symptoms for three or four days, but there are women that are particularly high risk. Um, certainly at Middlemore um, at the moment, about one in eight presentations to ED um, are COVID positive and about 13% of all those admitted uh, with COVID to Middlemore are maternity patients. So we are seeing quite a lot of women. The, one that are, the ones that are most at risk and the ones to be more aware of are those that are unvaccinated, those women who are immunocompromised, those women with medical comorbidities, and those that are approaching uh, delivery. So um, I've just quickly put on all this stuff. This is part of the regional healthcare pathways. Um, and we've just been updating all that. And from what I can tell when I logged in yesterday, I don't think all of this has been uploaded yet. Um, but just in general, I was just going to run through um, pregnancy in general. So from a respiratory COVID point of view um, in pregnant women, um, most women are just going to be able to self monitor symptoms. Um, there's some things in the pathways about being able to monitor heart rates and oxygen saturations. Um, I'm not sure how possible that will be to get that sort of equipment to them as the numbers increase. But I would probably go more on the side of caution with pregnant women. So pregnant women tend to decline a little bit quicker. Um, and so if you are contacted by a woman who um, is feeling very short of breath and unwell, then I'd probably go by the sort of send them in and we can have a look at them um, and assess them from a pregnancy point of view. In terms of blood pressures, it is ideal to be monitoring all women weekly with blood pressures. However, the ones that I think more specifically that just need to be focused on are those women who've already got preeclampsia or those who've got chronic hypertension or diseases that might um, sort of preclude them to having higher blood pressures. I think most people would be absolutely um, fine. So I think those are the ones to sort of concentrate on. In terms of VTE prophylaxis, in the next slide, I will um, go through things in a little bit more detail. But I think in general, those women who are fit and well at home with COVID, who aren't requiring admission to hospital, don't need to have Clexane. Those women who are admitted to the hospital with, mild, sorry, with moderate to severe disease are the ones that we will be thinking of giving Clexane for when they go home. Um, and then there is an assessment for other women who might fall in a more high risk category that might need VTE prophylaxis, but most people won't. In terms of uh, monitoring for fetal growth, um, from what we've heard from the Australian, Australian data, um, most um, pregnancies aren't going to be have growth restriction. However, here at counties, just because we don't have any long term data with Omicron, we decided that um, we're probably just going to add an additional scan at 37 to 38 weeks for those women who've had COVID in the community. And then if there's any problems with growth restriction, we think about an induction of labour. For our women who've been admitted with moderate to severe COVID, we're going to manage them as though we managed our Delta patients, and that's to organise scans about two to three weeks after discharge and then four weekly thereafter with a plan to produce them at about 39 to 40 weeks. This is just a chart that goes through about um, VTE prophylaxis and who does and doesn't need them, but that sort of goes through um, how to um, risk stratify people for those that do and don't need vaccine. So this chart is also um, part of the healthcare pathways. So this just goes through when you should refer for a secondary care review. And I think as a general rule, um, I would say if it's something that you would send a patient in for if they didn't have COVID, you should still be sending that patient into hospital even if they do have COVID. I'm a really firm believer that patient care shouldn't be compromised because the patient's COVID positive and we're set up here to review patients as and when they need it. Um, with the COVID symptoms, again, remembering that pregnant women can decline quicker 
Um, I'd probably always go on the side of caution to have women reviewed. And um, just remembering as well that optimally we would like saturations of 96% in pregnancy. So if you've got a woman that's sitting between 94 and 96, she's probably quite likely to decline and we probably would like to see her in secondary care. So this is more for um, GPs in South Auckland, but this is just how we refer to secondary care. And I think it'll probably be a similar system throughout the country. So all patients need a secondary care referral, but it's not necessarily a transfer of care. So for us, it just goes through the usual channels, which is on clinical portal and will be graded by an SMO. We realize that GPs are absolutely slammed and that um, these referrals do take a long time to do. If you can't manage to do a referral, there is an email address, women's health COVID team at middlemore.co.nz. Even if we just have an NHI, we can then triage that patient. And in terms of contacting us, we've got a COVID SMO on, we've also got a maternity assessment clinic SMO. Both of those are available during the week. And then out of hours, an obstetrics and a gynecology SMO um, that can be um, run to discuss anything. If you're not sure about anything with a pregnant woman, we are more than happy to be called at any time. Never feel like you are bothering us. We would rather that you bring up than try to manage things in the community that we should be seeing as inpatient. Um, and yeah, give us a call, ask for advice. We're always happy for you to speak to us. So just in general, I guess the main things that I just want to reiterate, we're always happy to help. Ring us, ring us, ring us. If you've got any queries, we can help. We're very happy to. If you've got a patient that you would usually send into hospital for an obstetrics or a gynecology reason, don't let the fact that they've got COVID stop you from doing that. If we need to do a clinical assessment, we should still do a clinical assessment. And just to remember as well, most patients will be absolutely fine. Most pregnant women who have had all of their vaccinations will be completely well, and this won't be particularly severe. And that's it from me. So thank you, Amy. Um, we'll just keep moving through. Won't take any questions at the moment. Um, but I'd like to introduce Dr. Amanda Taylor. She's a pediatric ID fellow at Starship, and she's backed up by... Uh, a number of senior pediatricians, Leslie Voss, Ann Tate, and Emma Best. So over to you, Amanda. My name's Amanda, and I'm a Peds ID Fellowship at Starship Hospital. Um, I have just come back from working in the UK um, in a Peds ID Fellowship role there, which turned out to be very covid -y. And today I'm going to talk to you around COVID-19 in children, as well as the um, one of the complications, which is known as PIMS-TS or MIS-C. So COVID-19 in kids. Um, so although children are just as likely to be infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus as adults, unfortunately, so fortunately, they're much um, less likely to be affected by it. And severe acute COVID-19 in children is really rare. Um, so the majority of children, in fact, will be asymptomatic or have a very mild illness with it. We do know though, however, due to Omicron's increased transmissibility, a number of countries, including the UK, as well as the United States, have noted increased pediatric admissions, particularly in the age zero to four year old group. Now, this is, however, quite difficult to interpret because a lot of the definitions of hospitalization or admission actually include children that are found to be incidentally positive at presentation. So often it's children presenting with things like a broken leg or appendicitis. So it's felt really that this peak in admissions um, is likely to be accounted for um, by children presenting with COVID-19 rather than because of it. And this is illustrated in a recent UK report, which found that the rates of hospitalisation in kids under the age of 10 had actually not increased significantly with Omicron variant compared to Delta. Furthermore, at the bottom of the slide, I've got a CDC report that found that kids under the age of 18 years of age had similar rates of ICU admissions, need for mechanical ventilation, as they did with Omicron um, compared to Delta. So in summary, although we are likely to see an increase in children presenting with COVID-19 during the Omicron wave, we have every reason to expect that for the most part, it will continue to be a mild illness in our pediatric population, possibly even more mild um, than the Delta variant. So when they present, what do we see? Well, as I've said, for the most part, children are asymptomatic or have a mild infection. So in this asymptomatic um, rate has been found to be up to 65% in some studies pre-Omicron and pre-vaccination. When they do come to hospital, what we see is presentations very similar to other common pediatric viral illnesses. So often they present with symptoms um, along the lines of bronchiolitis, viral induced wheeze, or gastroenteritis. 
in particular with the Omicron variant, we are seeing a lot more croup and certainly the rates of croup in the United States doubled over the winter period and they're labelling it COVID croup there. Important to note, just as I've got on the slide here, that um, it's really important to keep a broad differential when kids are presenting with COVID-19 and fever and sore throat in particular, bearing in mind that we do have a slightly different population with a higher rate of group A strep infection and thinking about consequences such as rheumatic fever. So important to keep swabbing these kids as well. In terms of risk factors for severity, well, it's being acknowledged that children um, are usually at um, greater risk of having more severe infection if they are younger, so particularly um, those who are sort of less than one month of age, but also um, children with underlying medical conditions may be at increased risk for having a more severe disease or requiring hospitalisation. Unfortunately, as with most um, COVID data in kids, uh, the evidence is not robust um, and the risk factors do vary depending on the cohort um, that has been studied. This list that I've popped up here is referenced from the Starship um, Clinical Guidelines um, and it's what we've defined as severe um, risk factors for severe disease or hospitalisation in our population and it's in line with the Australian risk factors as well. What I noted from my time in the UK, which was pre-Omicron and pre-vaccination, was that obesity seemed to be a really strong risk factor for more severe disease. So um, the, the most severe cases of COVID I saw in kids were those um, who were teenagers um, and who were overweight. In terms of outpatient management, so um, what, what should be, we be doing? Well, essentially it's supportive care. And um, so just like with all other viral infections, it's really good monitoring of hydration and other complications of an acute viral illness. As I said, for the most part, um, this infection in children is pretty mild. So bearing in mind, if you are seeing children who are presenting particularly unwell, keeping a broad differential and thinking about alternative diagnoses is key. Currently, there's um, no uh, paediatric community use of monoclonal antibodies or antiviral agents for PEDS in New Zealand. We're also not recommending any inhaled corticosteroids um, in either our health pathways or our Starship guidelines, simply because there is no evidence for the use of inhaled corticosteroids um, in paediatric COVID-19. In terms of what happens when these patients come into hospital, again, for the, um, for the bulk of them, they just need supportive care. So often they're admitted for some hydration or some oxygenation. If they are progressing down a more severe pathway, which is incredibly rare, um, we would then proceed um, along sort of adult lines with things like dexamethasone, remdesivir, tocilizumab, or varicitinib. Um, with regards to what we've seen at Starship, so this is some very um, back of the envelope um, calculations or data that I've been keeping an eye on since I came back from overseas. But essentially we've seen around 50 children admitted to Starship Hospital um, since October last year with SARS-CoV-2. And around a third of these were admitted for other purposes, so social admits um, or were unaccompanied minors to COVID positive parents. The median age has been around 14 months with a huge spread from one day up to 15 years. We have needed to give um, um, around 10 of these oxygen, but for the most part, it's low flow. It's a trickle and it's short lived. We've had one patient who needed to have high flow oxygen and the same patient was admitted to our HDU for less than 24 hours. Um, and he's the only one we've given remdesivir to to date. Uh, we've not had any PIMS TS or MIS-C cases. Um, and I'll tell you what that is just now. Um, so MIS-C or PIMS-TS is a multi-inflammatory syndrome of childhood, or in the UK we called it the um, Paediatric Inflammatory Multisystem Syndrome, temporally associated with SARS-CoV-2, so not quite as catchy. So essentially it's a post-COVID hyperinflammatory syndrome, and it occurs in the minority of children after COVID, so guesstimates are around 1 per 3,000 children with COVID will go on to develop this. Um, and it's around two to six weeks after an acute COVID-19 infection. Now, the, the kicker is that this infection can be asymptomatic or mild. The median age is around um, late childhood, so eight to 11, and the clues um, are really in the definition. So you need to have either an epidemiological link to a COVID case or have a recent positive test, and that can be PCR, RAT, or serology. When these kids present, they are unwell, um, so they often present with features like toxic shock syndrome or with features consistent with a Kawasaki's disease type presentation. So often those mucocutaneous features, so the conjunctivitis, the rash, the adenopathy. Quite commonly as well in the UK, we noted gastrointestinal intestinal features were very common. So often very severe abdominal pain um, and sometimes diarrhea and vomiting as well. 
So it's really just something to bear in mind. It is rare, but it can occur um, in a delayed phase after acute COVID infection. And it's important to bear it in mind in those kids who are looking unwell, that have an epidemiological link or a recent SARS-CoV-2 positive case. And if that was the case, um, we would um, expect them to be being discussed with your local paediatric team, um, rather than being worked up in the community. These kids are unwell, you'll know them when you see them. So in summary, um, just um, really basically severe COVID-19 in children is rare. We are likely to see more increased hospitalizations with the Omicron variant than we've seen previously, but we expect a lot of this will be incidental SARS-CoV-2 positives. The clinical presentation and treatment of COVID-19 is very similar to other common pediatric viral illnesses. And these are things that you guys are used to dealing with all the time. So it's the gastro and it's the croup. And it's just important to bear in mind um, that PIMS TS exists. So it's rare, but it is an important post COVID inflammatory syndrome. And we're happy to be talked to um, at Starship if you've got concerns regarding this. Um, and thank you for listening. I will now open it up to the panel um, to take any questions. At Mandra has summarized it really clearly. What we seem to be seeing is the under one year old um, bronchiolytic type children. Um, and um, the obesity has certainly been an issue in Australian um, children's hospitals, the teenager. So they seem to be the two key groups that we need to be concerned about. Um, as far as, um, and just like Amanda's pointed out, don't forget about rheumatic fever and strep throat. So if they're in high risk group, yes, I think we should be treating um, or, or getting at least remembering to get a throat swab and, and treat um, as your normal pathways for that um, and the, the clinical health pathways have been uh, cover a lot of this and, and uh, we have reviewed them as well um, so I think those uh, pathways are really useful um, and so it's um, yeah I, I think that some of my key points. I have a small question it's just I'm curious as why the neurodevelopmental kids would be at higher risk what's going on for them? Me to ask, answer that one, Leslie. Go or? for it. So it, I'm sorry, I'm Ann Tate, I'm a general paediatrician. So it'll be due to the fact that they've got poor lung capacity, they've got scoliosis, they've had probably recurrent respiratory tract infections. So they're usually the kids with quite severe cerebral palsy, um, other neuromuscular type conditions, that type of thing. So they're the sort of kids. You know, when we had our RSV outbreak, you know, we had some children admitted with pretty severe RSV as a result of that. So it's more just their general lung capacity, recurrent respiratory tract infections, and an inability to clear secretions. So. Okay, so uh, thanks, Amanda. That was great. Uh, covered a lot of ground there. Uh, we're just going to go over just sort of the general update. So we've got Christine McIntosh who all of you will know from uh, NRHCC, uh, Stuart Jenkins, who's the um, medical person for White Matar and Auckland DHB, and um, Callum Chapman, who will be talking about, uh, the he's the emergency management advisor. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, just really wanted to provide some updates really about uh, where we're up to with Fano HQ and obviously with the changes going into phase three, uh, which we will happen um, tonight. Uh, let me just progress somehow. There we are. Okay, so important things for primary care to know about phase three, uh, that your household bubble isolates for 10 days and the release day will be on the 11th day, as long as the test is negative for the other bubble members and they are asymptomatic. Uh, Stuart will go into more about this on the bubble chart, um, but that's really important. And it's just important to realize the change to doing uh, rapid antigen testing for bubble members now. Um, and the benefit of this, of course, is they get an almost immediate answer compared to the PCR testing, which has been um, very delayed in getting results for many people. Um, and it would le in leading to unnecessary delays and um, bubble members being released. Um, we no longer have close contacts as their non-household close contacts, so that's a really important change. Um, and as we said, rapid antigen testing is the main testing modality now, um, and it is considered diagnostic at this point of the outbreak. 
um, just from a public health perspective, there is now quite limited um, investigation of exposure events, just being uh, aware of that now, compared to our contact tracing process, which has had a really important role to play in the earlier stages of stamping it out and then um, flattening the curve. Um, it is now uh, more of a clinical prioritisation really about how we're managing people. Um, just to review from the perspective of how Fano HQ works, the COVID care and community in Auckland, and sorry for out of Auckland colleagues, this is specifically about Auckland. Um, those people in Auckland will know that we have a risk stratification and allocation process going on. So all Māori cases go to the Māori Regional Coordination Hub, Merch. The Pacifica go to Pacific Regional Coordination Hub. We are also having our cases picked up by primary care, and primary care have been doing a fantastic job with that. Um, we also have Whakarangaro contributing to the care for people in the community, as well as a much larger group now who are also on self-management. So just really important to realise that there are all those parts of that um, and that we have those additional services available and especially when you're using this the COVID care in the community module, previously called BCMS, now called CCCM, we shortened it to 3CM, uh, and that's how you can access further supports and so forth. Uh, it's really important that you're keeping in touch with the health pathways, so the COVID care, um, COVID management and adults health pathway is kept up to date actively every day at the moment. There is an um, up-to-date pathway for COVID care management of children now as well and there is also one there for management, managing um, pregnancy and COVID. Um, just to realise that there are escalation processes and um, hot off the press is there are now four Auckland Red Plus clinics that all operate from 8am to 8pm seven days a week um, for urgent care. So um, this is to allow for people who have COVID positive disease to be able to be seen for problems other than their COVID disease that will occur for the thousands of people who currently have COVID. And those appointments will initially be arranged through the Fano HQ uh, operations phone number and that will be advertised on Amedins and also on the health pathways as that all gets set up and established. Um, it's just important that we have continuing linkages with other parts of the system, such as the Regional Public Health Service, obviously ED, Secondary Care Services. Um, we also do have some rooms still in the isolation and quarantine facilities, although not a huge number of those, but there are alternative accommodation options um, actively ex being explored and some small amounts available. Um, and to, to access those, please liaise with the Fano HQ uh, operations phone number. Okay, um, just thinking about what this means for a GP and those people who saw my um, slides on the webinar two weeks ago in phase two, well, this looks a lot simpler now. Um, just recognising that the majority of people will enter a pathway now from a positive rapid antigen test. Um, and they may also enter the pathway as a probable case. And those people who have seen the medins in Auckland um, tonight will know that a probable case is a household member where there is an already an active case um, who is now symptomatic. Um, and what we do is there is a risk stratification um, and auto allocation process going on, as I said, to those regional coordination hubs, Māori Pacific and to the Fano HQ main NRHCC coordination hub. Um, GPs are able to pick up and to access those files no matter where they're sitting in the system and we'd encourage GPs to do that, particularly focusing on those patients you know may be more vulnerable and they're going to be at higher risk. If you know just looking at that new case that comes through that this person's going to be a lower risk person, then look, please prioritise your time. If you know that they're going to be lower risk, you don't think to anticipate any problems, um, you know, I think you do need to have to do some prioritisation there. We do recognise that low risk cases um, are uh, getting positive text message. They're able to access self-serve. And if you don't any, anticipate any problems with that, please um, let them do so. 
Uh, however, if you are picking up that patient, um, please do the following steps. Basically, an initial assessment, regular health check, please check the clinical acuity and to, to know how to do all this please actually look at the health pathways that will take you through and there is a quick guide now that's been placed there by our pho colleagues who've really helped us sort that out um, please choose active versus self-management this is a change that's coming overnight tonight and that will allow us to see in the system who's being actively managed Identify welfare needs, and there's a new flag going up to tell you which one specifically leads to a welfare referral. Please use the blue flag. Please use the yellow flags. The blue flag tells us that they're under primary care management. The yellow flag tells us that you need us to do a weekend call to that person because they are more unwell and are high acuity, clinical acuity. And then the only thing to do is to check whether or not there's anybody at higher risk in the bubble and to tell them they need to get a rat test to pick up those rat tests from their um, CTC. Um, and they need to test a, the bubble members on day three and day 10 or if anyone becomes symptomatic in the interim. What we're then expecting for primary care is that you follow along the lavender pathway and that you do that COVID case care um, focusing the care on those acuity fives and sixes. So those are people more moderately unwell. It includes, includes women in pregnancy. They come under acuity five and that we are, you're able to um, request an oximeter for those acuity fives and sixes. And I am totally delighted we've now gone to rapid antigen testing because I think we could be much more responsive in getting those oximeters out early to those people we anticipate are going to get more unwell and are gonna need those oximeters. So that's really great. Um, and essentially with phase three, that um, case, releases after 10 days and so does their bubble if they're asymptomatic and their day 10 rapid antigen test is negative if and and still will go through the bubble chart um, just just some some reminders about what's in um, the uh, COVID clinical care module if you look in the um, person information so you can see that on the left hand menu you'll see person information the yellow arrows are the new development that's going overnight. That will tell you that person is under self-management. Self-management is a default. That's what everybody goes into until somebody actively manages them. Active management looks like the yellow arrow here and active management here. Uh, you'll see the green arrow, the day zero, that has been improved and the new fix is going in for that so that it should correctly um, count the days now. The blue flag is the blue flag here. That's telling me at Fano HQ that this person has been managed by their primary care provider. And that may mean that you've gone in there, decided they're perfectly capable of self-managing, put a blue flag, said, I've done it, it's all sorted. And then you don't need to talk to them again if they know what to do next. Um, the yellow flag also goes along the side if you want us to do that weekend calling. So those are the things. So here you can see this person still needs an initial assessment. Here it has been done. Here you can see the clinical acuity. And if you were in the system, you would hover over that and it would say clinical acuity. It still needs to be filled in here. This one here it's done. This person's clinical acuity is five. And it really helps to have this continuing, you know, this shared care record, especially for those people who are more moderately unwell and for whom we need to do that ongoing care. Thank you, Christine. As we move into phase three, and, and this is where there's a significant amount of activity in the sector, uh, we need to understand the information that's coming through because it's a very information dense situation so this is something that we put together a, a little while ago and we we're up to version 18 taking account of all the changes that have been occurring um, so what we have here is what we refer to as the bubble chart now it's available on health pathways so um, we'll send out a copy through medins tomorrow um, but this version the latest version which does account for phase three will be um, available on Health Pathways. Um, and if I could just draw your attention to a, um, a couple of things, it's just to give you some practical advice. 
particularly for staff who are handling questions from patients asking about, well, you know, what's happening? Um, my son's got COVID. What's going to happen with us and how is it going to play out? And so the blue is really around um, tracking case management, either symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, and one of the key things there is when does my day zero start? And so it's um, in the case of asymptomatic, obviously from the day you get tested, but if you are symptomatic, then it, the clock starts from um, the, the date of the symptom onset. Um, we also talk to um, what happens post COVID um, for those who um, their employers are saying, well, we need um, a, a test for you to come back. Um, that's not going to be possible um, given that you are likely to be um, positive for the PCR for up to three months. And similarly with the rat test, um, not for three months, but certainly for a, um, a reasonable period of time. And um, there is no release um, letter um, patients can self-release. Um, for those who haven't been immunized, um, we're recommending no nothing um, for at least 28 days, but I'm hearing that might be extended out to 90 days. Um, the green um, um, flow chart is, is for the household contacts. Their timing begins um, the, sa uh, the same day as the case. So they follow the same timeline as, as the positive case. Um, there are rats um, required at day three and day 10, um, and then they can self-release after um, day 10. Obviously, if they turn out to be positive, their clock starts again as a case for 10 days. Um, so um, it's something that is, is worth looking at um, um, for yourselves. Now, I just wanted to quickly talk about um, rat tests. Um, we have got supervised rat tests out in primary care now. Um, and I think that the amount, the, the quantity um, will start, that's flowing through practices will, will be much steadier next week. The key things we want from rat tests are, um, we're moving to a test to treat or manage COVID. Um, and when we talk about that is the, the implication, some patients may require antivirals, they may require public health management, um, and it's ensuring timely access to, to care and support. The second principle is really around testing to return. Um, and that's particularly relevant for, for critical healthcare workers who need to get back to work. And there's a, um, there's a matrix that is available now on the Ministry of Health website talks to um, the details of that. But in essence, symptomatic patients can get rat tests. Um, and there are specific groups of asymptomatic, um, i.e. healthcare workers who can get um, access to rat tests. Um, so I'll finish there. Is there anything else, Christine, that we need to cover in terms of operational? aspects. I just have a few more slides just to talk about that. Sure. Um, so thank you. Um, so uh, uh, this is all pretty fresh. So rat reporting. Never had so many rats. Um, so a supervised rat is a rat that you do um, as um, part of primary care management. So um, and just recognising the way that you do that is you there is another thing through HealthLink called supervised rat report, and that's how you report a positive, or sorry, you report the rat result uh, in primary care. Um, there are unsupervised rats, so this is when somebody goes to a testing centre and they pick up a rapid antigen test. And there are two ways that that can be reported. Either it can be reported on My COVID Record, so people can go in through their My COVID Record and um, and um, follow that through to be able to report their rat result. The other option is they can phone the um, the 0800 number to report their um, result. Just to let you know, because I think that's in everybody's mind, is how does that then result in the system on them getting onto the pathway? And that really big arrow there is to show that actually all of it is now going to feed in to the national ESR eclair and be diagnostic 
for COVID-19 disease and create a COVID positive case. That COVID positive case goes through to the national contact tracing system and you might remember that we've talked about that quite a bit. That's the main data repository that holds everything together. And then it progresses from there immediately to make a COVID clinical care module record. And a lot of our Auckland colleagues had a lot of frustration over the weekend because it was slow to create those CCCM records. Um, but that's how it's all kind of glued together. The gist of this is that, that's, that's, that those problems have predominantly sorted out. Uh, and the gist of this is, is that if you do a rat test and it is positive, within two to four hours that will then create a CCCM record for that person. You don't need to request it, it will happen in the course of time. It just takes some time for it to get through the systems and leap through the systems. If you need to urgently do a, um, some care for CCM and you need that record, then please request it as outlined in the MEDINS information tonight and it's uh, also on Health Pathways. Um, just to remind people about Health Pathways, and we keep coming back to it, everything's on here, guys. We keep it up to date actively every day at the moment. Um, Helen Miley works very hard and behind the scenes as a clinical editor here to get all the information up, and we to do our very best to make sure that it complements the medins and then it links to the Health Pathways. But you will find everything on here and we often find that many of the questions that people ask are actually on the health pathways and so I do do reference that a lot. Thank you I think that's it from me. Oh, thanks Christine and Stuart. Stuart I've just got a question for you um, on that household contacts if they're positive and you're retesting them at day 10 for negative if they stay positive does that keep the whole household are we going to get this domino effect that was happening with some families? No, you no longer get the domino effect. Um, so, uh, so as long as that household contact um, tests negative for their rapid antigen test on day 10, then they are free to go. I, I thought, okay, my understanding was the problem with repeat testing is you might just pick up residual COVID rather than... Sorry, active. sorry, not the case. The case doesn't get retested. The case goes on yeah. day 10. Yeah, once, once you're positive, you, you're 10 days, um, um, the clock starts and, and you're released after 10 days. So that means a family member who tests positive could stay longer than 10 days? Correct. Yes, the clock restarts with the family member. Right. Okay. For that family member, the original family. case has gone okay. after 10 and days. And anyone else in the family whose day 10 rapid antigen test comes back negative and they are asymptomatic are also able to stop isolation. So that's a really big change for our families because they've had that domino effect going on. But there still be, could, could be some domino effect is what you're saying. Yes, if there's a little bit. Up if, day 10 positive. Yeah, so um, in Auckland, um, um, it had been a little bit ridiculous trying to get a day three test because people were waiting so long for their PCR results that just became a little bit ridiculous getting a day three test. But the idea of that day three rapid antigen test for the contacts in the family, the household contacts, is to try and pick up that um, COVID positive rapid antigen test early so that we don't end up with extended periods for families having to isolate. Um, so yeah. hopefully, hopefully we've made that clear there, Bruce. It's, it is a big change, and so I would reference that people go to the bubble chart and look at it. So to see Callum's come on board here. Hi, Callum. Yeah, thanks, Bruce. I'll just be very brief. Um, so if I just share my screen very quickly. So just wanted to say, um, kia ora, everyone, and thanks for your time on the webinar tonight. The primary care resilience tool has been developed to support practices, urgent care clinics, PHOs and the NRHCC to have an overview of the system as it responds to COVID. Um, further information on the web links and the how-to guide has been distributed on the medins and it's also now on Health Pathways. Um, in the development of the tool, uh, it's been really simplistic in its, in its form and its development. So the tool should take you less than two minutes to um, fill out um, and then it will map across the region um, 
sort of system pressures. And on this slide, you should be able to see on the left hand side what that inputting information looks like, um, which is the web form, um, and that transpires into a geo located um, geolocation in terms of where your practices are and the pressures um, in terms of what you've filled out. Um, so it, what we're looking for is sort of workforce pressures, uh, resource pressures, et cetera. Um, all the information's kind of uh, detailed on the methods. Um, so that's kind of, that's all. And thanks for having me on, your, on, the, on the webinar this evening. Okay. So uh, have any of the panel want to ask questions live or um, anything come up there that any of you like to answer? So somebody's asked about sore throat management and um, what to do about children. Do they actually need to swab? And the answer is no, you can treat empirically. Just use the pharmacy COVID free services that are available that are listed on health pathways. Use a pharmacy to sort out empiric antibiotics. Um, I can speak to COVID group. We're getting yep, a few wait, questions. Wait. Oh. Yeah, we're getting a few questions regarding COVID group, and it is something we've seen a bit of coming through Starship ED, and I know Middlemore is seeing a bit of it at the moment as well. Um, and yes, management is as is routine as per usual um, group, so it's very appropriate to give a, a dose of dexamethasone as you usually would, um, and just good return advice. Okay, rest of the panel, just as just as you see questions there. Um, is there an easy way to join people to a bubble? Uh, GPs are not able to link people to a bubble, but uh, Whānau HQ can do that for you. So um, you can um, set that as a task or contact the Whānau HQ team to do that. Um, I would suggest that we only need to link people into a bubble if they have symptoms that we are concerned about or we need to do some active care for them. Um, or they, and they will come if they become a case. If that makes sense. Uh, can you change day zero? Um, so currently you can't change day zero. Day zero is changed in the national contact tracing system, but the calculation will get a lot better now, both because that is being updated um, to be more accurate in the NCTS system, but also because our day zero is going to get more accurate now because we're using rapid antigen testing as diagnostic. So people are more likely to pitch up when they first get symptoms and that will much more um, will reflect day zero better I suspect. Question here for Christine, did you say COVID positive cases have to have a negative rat test on day 10 before release or is it just the asymptomatic household by bubble members? No we expect that people with COVID-19 are likely to probably still have a positive or a, potentially a po positive co uh, rat test at day 10, please do not test cases over again. <laughs> do not test cases over again. PCR rat tests, don't test them. Okay, um, to let them out, they, they are a case and they just need to do their 10 days and then they are out. Are we now able to change day zero based on symptom onset? Um, what I encourage GPs to do if they're getting frustrated with that system is just document what day 10 days is for that person and then, then let them out. Okay, can you discuss more regarding self-serve? Sure. So um, self-serve is what is offered when they get the text message for a positive COVID-19 result and they are offered a link where they can go in and they can complete some information on about their um, current symptoms and their comorbidities and then they can also complete some information about um, contact tracing. And right. um, Sorry. Yeah, carry on. Uh, and so that information doesn't flow through hugely into the CCCM module, but what it allows us to do is allows us to have some opportunity to um, identify people who are more symptomatic. It also directs them if they are symptomatic and they need urgent care, you know, urgent help to, um, to seek that help, but also directs them to their GP or to Healthline for additional help if they need it. Um, what I will say about in Auckland is that as a Fano HQ over, overarching program is that we have some fail safes in place now. So we have a risk of hospitalisation tool for the entire Auckland region. Um, and what this allows us to do is it allows us to look and see across the records whether or not somebody has taken up the care for somebody who is at higher risk of hospitalisation. 
and just admission to the paediatricians here, sorry, it doesn't go all the way down to the paediatric ages um, because of issues with um, BMIs and so forth in that space. Um, but what that allows us to do is to identify anybody who's at higher risk who hasn't been um, called or contacted within that first 24 hours. So there is that across the entire program now. It's not perfect, so if you think we've got it wrong, please do do the active care. Somebody's saying red test, where from? Yep, so our CTC testing centres now have a good supply of rats. Are they available to general practice? General practice have their own supplies of um, rapid antigen tests um, that they are able to access. Uh, so their PHOs will assist them with that if they have not already got their supplies. Right, if patient test positive, has a positive rat, how long will we expect to stay positive rat in the system after all symptoms disappear? I don't know the answer to this. Does anyone on the panel know exactly yeah. how long? Um, when they brought in the critical um, health or critical worker thing, they said that I think it was around 60 to 70% will be rat test negative by day seven. Hence, why what what's being used towards the critical um, worker? Uh, so probably about seventy percent will be negative by day seven, sixty to seventy percent. How long they'll be out? How long they'll be positive after that? I'm not completely sure. It's not a good way of testing to return to work, though, is it? That it's not a sign of that you're infectious. It's being used a little bit that way, that if your rat test negative, you are uh, not in, uh, infectious. So it is being used a little bit as a, a marker of infectivity. Um, but is it a good marker of that? Possibly not. Um, it's primarily biggest value, I guess, is if you're asymptomatic. And um, so if you're asymptomatic and rat test negative, then your infectivity is certainly significantly lower. So one of the issues that GPs in South Auckland are finding, um, I've had a few messages today about it, is some employers are wanting them to have a rat test to be negative before they return to their workplace. Would you have to comment on that, Leslie? Uh, well, I guess that's in the critical pathway, isn't it? But that's only for critical workers where they rat, do a rat test before they come back to work on day five and then again on, um, on prior to the shift on day six. Um, but I couldn't answer about other employees that the employers that are outside of that um, critical uh, worker pathway. Um, I think it would be really difficult to do that. So I couldn't make any comments on that, but it is part of the critical uh, worker pathway. Aside from the critical worker pathway, um, my understanding is that once they've done the 10 days of isolation as a case, they have done their time and that an employer should accept them back at work at that point in time. Yeah, absolutely. That's what um, the messaging is supposed to be out there. So Christine, this might be for you. Can we release patient on CCM on day 10 for the patient aware they can't leave isolation until day 11? They need to complete 10 days. Okay, so 10 long full days. 10 full days, okay. Um, I'm having trouble getting clinical notes out with it, uh, getting out the clinical notes within the CCM to go to the next part of the module. Any clues? Um, can they please email um, the Fano HQ team and we'll, we'll try and tackle that and see exactly what the issues are for you. I think I need a bit more of description. Okay. Can we rest day zero using the tabs you have shown? It has been wrong every time I have done this mm. within this patient on CCM. Yeah, it's caused a lot of frustration out there. Um, please just document what you're doing. If you find that it is wrong, please just document in the notes what you're doing and what you're doing around releasing them. It will be fine. Thank you. It, it, should improve, it should improve in the next 24 hours, but if it's still not perfect, just please document what you're doing. It's that old issue, isn't it, of building a plane while you're flying it? Uh, it is. And, uh, yeah. uh, question from Lynn. Day zero, can this be updated in the box as many default to positive tests versus first day of symptoms? Uh, 
uh, I'm just trying to figure out what this is. Um, I think it all goes back to that day zero issue. And look, normally it's going to be resolved. Um, just not document what you're doing, otherwise that's fine. Yeah, look, I, I think there's two things here. One is that the, if the system can't manage it, um, just you manage it with your patient and say, look, you know, um, I mean, I think the, the key point here is that as we get to this stage, the pandemic, it's all about slowing the disease down and, um, you know, whether the IT can, can or can't keep up with it is not really an issue. No, um, use the bubble chart and do your best. Yeah, Document just be, what you're doing. Just be pra practical about these things. Um, have we got any questions for the paediatricians or obstetricians that you can obviously see there? Because we're very much into the, the patient management system and the primary care side of this at the moment. Um, and the questions are starting to blow out. We're now at 110. So. I did see one that came up there. It was, uh, was, was uh, presumably from a GP. It said, well, what is the role of the lead maternity carer versus the GP in the obstetric care of COVID? I think I'll let Amy answer that one because she's been writing the guidance on that specifically. Um, so I think we would expect, expect that the LMCs would manage the sort of pregnancy side of things. I guess the thing is often the GP might be the first one who gets the notification of positive COVID swab. So sometimes the LMC might not know. Um, and so or if the patient kind of comes to you it might be as a GP, you might see them before the LMC does. We also, particularly in South Auckland, I think we've got um, six or seven community midwives that are servicing thousands of patients. We've got a massive midwifery shortage as well. Um, so the LMCs might take a little while to pick up those sorts of things as well. Um, but yeah, from a, from a sort of uh, pregnancy point of view, they're definitely the ones who should be referring to us. But if they haven't, you can also refer to us or if the patient comes to see you, refer to us. I think that's important too, because it's the GP who's going to get that positive result in the inbox um, or mm -hmm. might even do the test and within the practice as well. And I think that's a really important point. And also, I think given um, pregnancy is a condition in which we would want them to get an oximeter, it's really important to um, be proactive around that uh, and make sure that we are supporting that. And it is the GPs and the practices who have access to CCCM through their practice management system and can order that oximeter by doing a task and requesting that oximeter from, um, and that will be delivered uh, usually within 24 hours by one link uh, once you raise that task. So um, we've got a really effective mechanism through primary care to be able to do that. So I would encourage that. Are there, once the numbers get much bigger, are there gonna be enough oximeters for everyone? Uh, so what we have done is that originally in the Delta outbreak, almost everybody got an oximeter, um, but with the um, support of our clinical governance group um, around Fano HQ, we've been well supported in actually restricting the oximeter use to those people who are more moderately unwell or, or a higher risk. And so they're only going out to acuity fives and sixes now. Um, and uh, then that is substantially reducing the number of people who need an oximeter. So I think that is a good use of the supply of oximeters. Um, and it's been, it, as I say, it's been well supported by um, our clinical governance group um, spanning paediatrics, obstetrics, and our general medicine colleagues across the region. Can I just answer a question, Bruce, about... Um, patients are still symptomatic at day 10 um, because previously you had to wait, you know, until you were symptom free for three days. That's now up to um, clinical discretion of the GP um, as to whether they feel the patient's well enough to leave or um, whether they need to be reassessed. Right. Um, so there's another question here around... Um, self-reporting um so i'm sorry i might have missed that christine in terms of the options there are um go, patient going into to my health um uh, my COVID health record and um recording um the fact that they're positive or they can contact for karunga row um as another option i think it's the third option christine 
can't remember quite what it was, but this is going to be more and more apparent that um, patients will be self-reporting. Yeah, so currently um, there are the um, My COVID record, which would lead to the rapid antigen reporting and um, also using the phone number, the 0800 phone number. Um, all of this is on health pathways and when they turn up to a testing centre, they're given this information about how to do this. Um, a small number, um, you know, like we can, they, they can still get a PCR test, but um, we're really encouraging any testing site to explain that there is going to be a delay to getting a result to that, and that a, a rapid antigen test is equivalent to a positive PCR from a diagnostic point of view as far as the system is concerned now. Uh, there's been a couple of paediatric ones there. There was one about the newborn infant. Um, they... Um, We've had a number of uh, positive women and the newborns uh, so far haven't acquired the disease, uh, but most of them do do uh, reasonably well. Um, it's more an issue around the complications of the pregnancy, the prematurity that causes um, some of the concerns. Um, so most of the newborn, term newborn infants um, do reasonably well. Um, and uh, there was another question about long COVID, which uh, appears to be uncommon in children. Um, and uh, it's still being sorted out, I think. Um, and there'll probably be some pathways around how that's managed. And um, Emma may like to comment more on uh, long COVID or Anne. Um, there was also another question on um, gastro symptoms in children and the ED department, um, Children's ED at the Starship said they're getting quite a few children with just straight abdominal pain uh, with no other symptoms. So they've been coming in uh, as possible appendic appendicitis, uh, but are clearly just COVID related. So there's quite a bit of nausea, uh, vomiting and diarrhea, but there's also just this uh, straight abdominal pain with no fever. Um, so uh, that just needs to be um, carefully looked at. So they can be mimicking uh, appendicitis. So just something to be a little bit uh, wary of. A couple of questions for you there, Christine, up the top. Um, is there a contact for ADHB, WDHB? And the other one from Brett. Yep, so the, the one at the top there was around contact with uh, for obstetrics at the other DHBs. Again, I'll point you towards the um, management of COVID and pregnancy health pathway. And if you go to the request section, you'll find the linkages there to our colleagues in ADHB, WDHB and Counties Medical Health. Um, and it's all on there on the health pathways. Uh, Brett's question, how do you register a community done rat on children who don't have a my COVID record, i.e. not a supervised rat by us? Sure, use the 0800 number to do that. Okay, so that sounds good. Uh, there was a question there about getting nose samples. The paediatricians might like to answer this. Nose samples and throat samples in kids, five rotations in the nostril. Um, sounds like a big task. Any, any tips you guys know how to examine kids? Do you want me to leap into that one, Leslie? And, and I would have thought it was actually pretty easy. Just hold them down. To, like that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's certainly going to be easier than doing a PCR, I would have thought. Eh? So um, just, I would have thought just doing the same like you do for throat exam, you know. It's, you know, pretty, I would have thought, be quick. <laughs> And determined, eh? Because you have determined, to yeah. Work. Having a good stronghold of the parents, so it'll be all yeah. good. Yeah. Double, double, uh, double hold, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's still, that's still by okay. Yep. We heard it from you first, Anne. So. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Why are we going back to day three for household contacts? Is that a legitimate question? Yeah, so we've, we've got a, a few of those questions. And also, why are we going to day 10? Um, that's the advice that we've had from the ministry. Um, so uh, we have questioned that, um, but the answers we've got back today, it is definitely day three and now day 10. 
Yeah, day three didn't make any sense when our PCR results were taking six days to come back because by the time people knew there were a case there, household contacts had passed the day three mark and they were almost at the day eight mark. So it didn't make any sense to do a day three test. Um, but now with rapid antigen testing, of course, you're going to get an answer um, quickly. And so it does make sense to identify your cases within a household at day three if you can, because that means that they will only need to do 10 days from that point. And um, while, rather than waiting till day eight or day 10 to get a result and then having to do their 10 days from that point, especially if they're asymptomatic, because you know they don't get a symptom to, symptoms to indicate that they've got infection. Uh, the day 10 makes sense because you're just testing them just before releasing them. So it kind of kind of does make sense now compared to your PCR which just was not coming back in any sort of timely fashion to enable um, sensible kind of management of a bubble. I'm um, happy for any panel members to, to, to talk about that, but that's that's my, my sense making of that. Okay, if a rat test is negative and the patient is symptomatic, what advice do we give them? Stay home till well, do they need a repeat rat test at any stage? So if somebody is symptomatic and they've got a negative rat, then I would do a PCR at that point in time. I was assuming that they, they were, oh, okay, right, okay, yeah. Okay, so we've got some answers there. Especially if they've got COVID consistent symptoms. Our patient has done supervised rat and reported positive results through phone line two days ago. Still no CCM record. Okay, just let us know at Fano HQ um, to set up the probable case for you, and um, and let the NH give us the NHI, and we can troubleshoot through the background to see exactly what happened there. Okay, um, what, I was going to say, Bruce. One of the questions here is this: um, if someone has symptoms and they have a negative test, and you're still suspicious, then you can um, presume that they've got COVID and, or you can retest them the day following. But I mean, just if it sort of, I guess, looks and smells like COVID, um, go with it. Mm. Um, you can use a, a PCR test um, at, on the same day um, just to back that up. If they've got a negative COVID uh, rat test and you think, no, this is COVID, or you can bring them in the next day and repeat the rat. Okay, question here about payment. Uh, does it automatically follow the CCCM form, the three CM, I should say, form filling, or do we have also to make a POAC claim? Yeah, that's a really good question. Given a lot of the frustrations at the weekend with CCM records getting created and so forth, and and uh, primary care having to use their own practice management systems to provide the care in the interim. Uh, look, we really recognise that this was an issue, and we're currently examining that in a lot of detail as to actually. Um, setting up to make sure that practices are going to be able to claim against the work that they have done um, and we'll be advising on that in the near future. Um, I would say that using the CCM record does really assist um, that continuity of care so I would be particularly choosing in primary care and I, I think I've seen another question on this as well I think choose your time wisely in primary care because I saw a question there to say, how do I know whether I should be doing COVID care for somebody versus doing the other stuff I need to do in primary care? Um, I would say that you do need to make a, um, some decision making around actually, is this person going to be at higher risk? Are they sitting in a family bubble that is going to be at higher risk or not? Um, and um, making some decisions on that if you can. Now, what is happening is when I said that risk of hospitalisation has been done for the entire Metro Auckland population, uh, we are getting that data out to primary care over the next week or so. And that may also assist you to know whether or not somebody is at higher risk if, uh, if you want to have a process around that in your practices. Um, I think you do have to make a decision, you know, and certainly... I would only focus on an initial assessment for somebody and their family. And um, once you decide that actually there's not a lot of risk within this family group and you know that they can call for help if they need it, even if they're mild or moderately unwell, but you know that they'll call for help if they need it, then I would take a hands-off approach and let them call you if they need it. 
okay? And um, so I just prioritize that first call and after that, if they don't need anything more, don't do anything more, <laughs> okay? Got an interesting one here um, on about false negatives. If the patient is symptomatic and has a negative rat, can we do a PCR? So high pretest situation, do yeah. you need the gold standard? Of course you can, yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. Or repeat the rat the following day. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Everyone happy with that? Right. Yeah, and I just think if we just all understand that if we're using a rapid antigen testing, then our PCR turnaround time will get better. So if so we reduce the demand on PCR testing, our turnaround time is going to get better. So use our rats wherever possible. But if in doubt, you know, if we, we've got those specific situations, then, then that um, preserving our PCR will allow us to turn it around quicker. How is the patient's GP notified of a positive test, especially if the test is done by a different clinic? Um, so it, GPs will, now let me just check this. The GPs will know if they've done the test themselves or the other person who's done the test has copied the GP clinic in. Um, but what I understand is that all of the testing that was done through CTC should also be copying a result into the GP the enrolled GP's inbox now as well. So that happened a number of weeks ago, a month ago. I don't know. I've lost track. <laughs> okay. so, uh, Bruce, can I just talk about, about one thing, and that's um, healthcare workers, and just yep. remind everybody that actually there are um, a separate, um, separate guidance around healthcare workers um, returning to work, um, and that's available on Health Pathways. Um, that's something that, that Dune wanted to talk to in the past. The other thing I'd like to mention is that if we remember our um, Australian GPs who came on, what they were saying was that 90% of the cases that they saw with COVID um, were, were really not, not an issue at all. Um, it's only a small percentage that you're going to have to think about focusing your efforts on. So if you have a household contact and you get sick, you don't need a rat. You have COVID automatically. Yes. So this is the presumed COVID case, Christine. Um, so I heard that. So if you are a household contact of a known case and you become symptomatic, yes, you're a probable case. So they need they need t testing at that point. Uh, testing uh, so a rapid antigen test and putting that into the result in will create that CCM record. Um, so it triggers the whole process, but we also can put probable cases directly into the national contact tracing system. But you will need to contact Fano HQ to do that. But what I suggest you do is to direct them to get a testing uh, rat test from a local testing centre to and get that into the system if they can. But look, you know, they are a probable case. Um, you could sit, set them from symptom day zero, the onset of their symptoms, and manage them as a probable case if it's just not possible for them to get that rapid antigen test. Um, if you still have symptoms at 10 days, can you release some patients? tend to have viral symptoms ongoing for a while, but surely won't still be infectious. Uh, maybe Amanda, you might want to have a go at that one. Unmute if you want to, I can read it again. If you still have symptoms at 10 days, can you release some patients tend to have viral symptoms ongoing for a while, but surely won't be infectious? Oh, I might have to defer to Leslie on that one. Um, okay. That's yes, yeah. so. This is in the healthy, immune competent patient. Yeah. Um, then generally, if they've gone back to baseline or significant improvement in their symptoms, um, then we have been saying they can um, de-isolate if they're immune compromised, um, or they have been severely, critically unwell. But in that case, they're probably still in hospital. Uh, they will be isolating for longer. Um, but yeah, the, if there's been significant improvement back to their baseline symptoms or back to baseline symptoms they used to, like hay fever and allergies, then we're saying uh, 10 days is uh, usually appropriate. Yeah. 
Well, presumably clinical judgments needed, isn't it? If, if the coughs get, I mean, coughs go on for three to four weeks with usual upper respiratory things. So uh, I guess if they're getting better, then you would sort of err on the side of letting them go rather than keeping them. Absolutely. I mean, most, most all their other systemic symptomatologies resolved and they've just got that persisting post um, viral cough or they've, they've gone back to a baseline uh, hay fever type allergy uh, approach, but usually it's clinical judgment on that. Okay. Um, can we uh, enter rat positive unsupervised? Or does that go back to HQ? Um, so the primary care are to enter supervised rats, um, not unsupervised rats. So there are the 0800 and my COVID record to enter the unsupervised rats. So unsupervised rats are being provided at CTCs at the moment. And they're also um, a source for um, household contacts who are needing testing. They can, um, they can pick up um, rat tests from CTCs. Any tips for COVID bronchiolitis, usual Rx? Any pediatricians want to have a go at that one? I can do that one. Supportive care. And obviously, if they need, you know, feeding support, if they're not feeding or, you know, you think they need oxygen, they come to hospital. So most of the ones I've seen is just really they need some tube feeding and then they're good to go. Uh, here's a nice summary one. What specific scenarios we should recommend PCR testing instead of RAT? Sort of racking my brains about that one. I think <laughs> it, I think I think it's if somebody's got COVID symptoms and they've got a negative rapid antigen test. Um, I was just trying to think what what actual things and you know like if it was me turning up to a testing centre now, I'd want my rapid antigen test and I want to know the answer. Um, so. <laughs> Any of the pediatricians on that? I think that would be uh, um, when would you do a PCR rather than a rat test? Um, probably only in our hospital setting would we look at it. Um, so we discussed a little bit of this at work, but that would be generally our inpatient. So I'm not sure that we'll be doing much in the way of PCR testing um, in our ED department, except for those patients being admitted. Uh, and there'll they'll be just selected scenarios there. So I'm not completely sure where we want, might want it. Um, I'm sure there'll be something that I haven't thought of. Somebody's, re point. somebody's reminded me that under six month olds can't have rapid antigen tests. Is that correct, pediatricians? Mm. <laughs> so would they become presumed case probable case? I, I think that you usually find that the best thing is that they'll just be presumed or probable cases because I think that's what's been happening with a lot of children and families anyway. Um, so I think we'd probably leave it at that one. Uh, they'll they'll get PCR, I'm sure, if they ended up at hospital. Um, no, I'm just um, hearing from behind me um, from our testing workers that you can't under six months of age, use a rat test. You can't use a rat test, yes. No. So when can they travel after infection if they stay positive for a while? Airlines need a negative test. Is it going to be negative rat tests or negative PCRs? Do you know? Anybody know? Well, you'll be negative with a rat before you become negative with a PCR. Um, right. And, yeah, so... Don't know the answer to that no, one. It's not a perfect can... world where we have a perfectly yeah. formed answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, one hopes the length for the PCRs is going to shorten if you're planning to fly. Um, you know, you don't want to be waiting five days. I think there's a, a 72 hour um, window, isn't there, before you fly? So. so, pharmacy are performing the rapid antigen tests for local, um, you know, for national travel, so local travel. Right. Um, so, um, so it will it won't be the PCR that you'll need to do that localized travel. Yeah, the international airlines had their own requirements early on in the um, outbreak that each airline had specific requirements of. So it's probably people will just have to look online and and uh, find out what that airline's requirement is. Okay. 
No. But can the GP clinic staff initiate the self-serve text to patients? Uh, yes, so that will happen if you uh, enter a rapid antigen test through the HealthLink um, supervised RAT report, and that will initiate that positive text and the self-serve for the person. For a person who is symptomatic but tests negative initially on RAT test, when should they repeat the RAT test? Probably one for your bubble diagrams, Stu. Yeah, um, so the next day. Okay. Um, so, so uh, if you, you know, if it's symptomatic and you think it's COVID, then do a PCR immediately after the rat test before they leave. How do we know a patients happy to self serve? Uh, pass. I guess you ask them, don't you? Um, everybody gets offered it if they have a, um, a valid text and so forth and there is a fail safe around there so that if they do not self-serve within 24 hours it's followed up by our um, partners CBG um, who had been doing the contact tracing element of it and there is a 24-hour fail safe on that so if somebody doesn't do the self-serve on registering a COVID positive then they will get a phone call. Uh, Heather's got a question. Day zero is the first day of symptoms. So does that need to be changed? Uh, sorry, yes, correct. Day zero is the first day of symptoms. Um, as we've explained, there are some issues with the, the CCCM as to how to manage that. But day zero is the first day of symptoms. Or the positive result if you're asymptomatic. Okay. So when you do the test, so with PCR, it's the day you did the test, it's your day zero if you're asymptomatic. Right, okay. If patients um, still have, sorry, Karen, Christine. Sorry, I, I had sort of a question there about what to do about the weekends. If you are a GP who's not looking at your inbox the weekend, because you think um, actually it's a really good idea to have a mind break from this all, which I think is a very, very good idea. What we are doing at the Fano HQ uh, and the Pacific and Māori Regional Coordinations Hubs is that we are particularly starting prioritisation to make sure we do a review of those people who are at higher risk of more severe COVID and we work down the list. Okay, so um, yes, the low risk people uh, may well not get a call from us at the weekend on your behalf, um, but we will be calling those people at higher risk to the best of our ability, starting with the highest risk and working our way down. Here's a nice one. How does the isolating bubble get their supply of rat tests for day three and day 10? From the testing centres, CTCs. So they get delivered or they, somebody has to drive there or? So they can drive there. Um, uh, I'm not aware that we have delivery, so I'm not on the testing team to know exactly how they're managing that, um, but primary care practices also have the supervised reps. So it's kosher to get in a car and go to a testing centre and Absolutely. come back? Okay, so you're not going to get arrested or anything? Um, no, okay. no, as, as we've always had, that if you, you are allowed to leave for the purpose of testing from your isolation. My daughter's school is using the day three and day eight test to check if a student can go back to school. Um, so going into phase three tonight, it will be a day three rapid antigen test and a day 10 rapid antigen test to leave isolation as long as you're asymptomatic. It's on the, just to answer the question on on delivery of rats it sounds like there's a process in place to to set something up um, and they're going to advise practices of what that'll look like in rather rapid development on the rapid mm -hmm. antigen testing distribution front i'm seeing some questions here also about the funding so the national funding framework for a rapid antigen test is 45 dollars for a supervised rat from um uh, the primary care setting, the way that we have managed it. So those in primary care in Auckland will know that if you've done a PCR test and assessment in Auckland, it's been paid at $120. Um, because of the rapid antigen test framework funding, 
uh, that will be paid at the $45 and then please follow the directions of the Medins tonight and on the Health Pathways for completing your e-notification of um, COVID activity to ensure that you get paid the remaining up to the balance of $120 um, for the assessment component of what you do. So just please follow that Medins and the Health Pathways for exactly how to manage that so that you get funded equivalently for a PCR as you do for a supervised rapid antigen and assessment. Uh, well, there's, some, there's something there about um, the frustrations about entering the vaccine information on CCCM and everyone will be very pleased to know that that frustration is going to leave the system tonight and they will no longer have to do a whole string of things once you start to enter vaccine information in CCM. So everybody will be rejoicing about that one. So how quickly can you do the 3CM thing now? Because it was originally 40 minutes. Um, I think we're getting it down to around about 20 minutes now. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, Māori Regional Coordination Hub do what they call a power um, assessment and they can do it in 12 minutes, they reckon. They just crack through it. Right. Okay, so we've got... Uh, I think once you get familiar with it, it gets a lot easier. Yeah. I guess having the same people doing it is probably an advantage, isn't it? You know, so we've got a personal best of 12 minutes. Okay, so see how you go, folks. Any, uh, any other big questions or comments? I'm just very aware of the time. Um, and Bruce, there's just one here, which, which um, and I think this probably happens more often than we realise, um, a COVID-positive patient who has a partner who they see regularly but doesn't live with them um, now we're actually the the advice from Wellington silent on that but I think we should just be um, practical about that and assume that's probably the one household and just treat them as a single bubble and it'd be good to get them tested at day three and day ten that's they're coming and going from the bubble yeah if they they can't, you know, it's it's shared custody arrangements and all sorts of things. Yeah. And here's quite a good one. Are there any mobile testing units to test patients in home who can't access GP or testing sites? Uh, indeed, there yeah. are. Yeah. Um, but obviously, they're not endless. Um, uh, particularly, our Māori and Pacific providers have been uh, doing a fantastic job around these services. Uh, but I understand that was exactly what uh, Stuart was leaning behind him and asking before uh, from the testing team is that we will um, be uh, giving some more information on that as it becomes available but obviously given the large numbers it's not going to be it's got to be some pretty extraordinary circumstances to do that yeah yeah there's delays of three to five days at the moment as you appreciate any other big questions there folks If not, I might just call it uh, full time now, just, just so I can thank um, our, our hospital colleagues and, and, uh, and to Christine and Stuart for their um, sterling effort and keeping, uh, keeping the show on the road. It's uh, an ever moving target. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, there will be another webinar next week. I have some thoughts about it. Maybe we need to be talking about the 3CM um, there just seem to be a hell of a lot of questions about that at the moment um, that seems to be dominating the clinical stuff. Uh, Christine? So there is, um, there is a drop in um, Zoom uh, most days and that's I think advertised on the Health Pathways um, for 3CM if you're having any difficulties and they'll, um, they'll help you troubleshoot any difficulties that you're having so um, please do look for that if you are having troubles and um, and, uh, and the, the team there will be happy to help you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And uh, keep up the good work in primary care. It's, it sure is busy out there. And uh, thank you, everybody. We'll get through this. Good night. Yeah, thanks, Bruce.